Well, that certainly means I'm not in our church service. That doesn't normally <laughs> happen. <laughs> what a privilege to be with all of you today. Thank you for inviting me to do this with you. I know that I fit this group kind of like a bust of Luther fits the Vatican. You know, it's a... Uh, <laughs> But uh, I, sure am, I sure am enjoying being with you. I'd like you to meet the most important person I've ever known on this earth, and I've known her for 64 years, my wife, Cynthia. If she ever writes the unauthorized biography of Chuck Swindoll, I'm finished. Oh, my. A number of years ago, Cynthia and I drove from Dallas down to Houston. We chose to, we chose to drive rather than fly because... Uh, we wanted time along the way to talk, and we wanted to be uh, in the car as we were at various familiar sites along the way. Uh, in returning to Houston, where we had not been for really decades, we were returning to our roots. I. Uh, our childhoods were spent separate from each other, but they were like each other. She was a little girl growing up in the outskirts of Tyler, and I was uh, growing up just a year or two earlier than when she was born. Uh, I, I was growing up in El Campo. Don't bother to check it on your uh, <laughs> GPS. It'll the, uh, the places we grew up were very unimpressive, very small, and uh, today would be considered very insignificant. But they represented the places of our fondest memories because we were reared by great parents of the greatest generation. Uh, by the time we returned to Houston for this trip, both sets of our parents had, had died. So we were going back to kind of relive the moments of years gone by. We had by then reared our family and uh, I had been called back to Dallas to be a part of the leadership team at Dallas Seminary and had been out in California before this for almost 25 years. So coming back to Texas was coming back to our roots and then returning to Houston was, was uh, quite a journey. If you've never done that, you owe it to yourself sometime in the future to go back to where it all got started. When the war broke out in World War II, my father was a little too old for the draft, and so we moved to Houston for, for us, uh, for him to be involved in what was called defense plant work as he was in, engaged in a particular uh, uh, machine shop kind of work where they built the equipment for the for the bombers and the fighters. Uh, Cynthia was in Tyler during that time. And when she was about junior high age, middle school age, her folks moved to Houston. I moved there when I was in the third grade. So going back, we, we went back to, to look at the houses we lived in when we were children and the schools we attended and the uh, churches we had been involved in 
before we had known each other. And then, of course, we began to relive the, the months when we dated each other. We, 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 we met each other early and uh, fell in love. I, I waited a week to ask her to marry me just to make sure she was the one. And so once I got that taken care of, <laughs> her, daddy, her, her daddy should have shot me, I'll tell you. It, 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 it just, but I knew, I, I, I just knew she was the one. And uh, to quote Edgar Allan Poe, ours was a love which was more than our love in that kingdom by the sea. I adore this woman. And while we were in Houston, we began to re, uh, relive in our minds what life had been like and how much it changed. How much it changed about the places where we had lived and how much it changed in our lives. Everything had changed but our God. He had remained the same. Now, I, I have to tell you, it, it was a marvelous thing to sit in front of a house where you were growing up and, and you look at it now, all these years later, and, and you, you play back in your mind things that occurred there, and you, you drive the roads that you must have driven hundreds of times, and then the, the places where we were when we were dating each other and the church where we got married and the first house we we had built and lived in and all of this before I'd gone into the Marine Corps and and we realized that all through this how faithful and good God had been to uh, watch over us and, and to bring us to where we were it was great. Sort of dripping with nostalgia. And I, I love moments like that. And she does too. In, in, in fact, it reminded me of, of the words of that great theologian, Waylon Jennings, <laughs> who has a great album named The Eagle. And in The Eagle, he has this song's Splintered wood, rusty chains. This old front porch swing remains a pendulum of memories, swinging back and forth on a summer breeze. Singing old church hymns and nursery rhymes from the days way back before my time. With a little child upon my knee, singing every sweet word back to me. Then the great line, look how far I had to come to get back where I started from with a child's wisdom passing time. Singing old church hymns and nursery rhymes. To switch gears suddenly and to bring us back or up to where we are now I want this conference to be for you what that journey was for us. I want you to see it as a place that you can drive a stake in time when you were there and you were able to revisit the way you were and the way things are now. Because you see, uh, God is at work, and with him there is no yesterday, today, and tomorrow. With him there is this ever-present now. And that perspective helps so much in life because we change Times change, neighborhoods change, settings change, churches change, but he remains. He is the same yesterday, today, forever, 
And when he brings you to a place like this, and you're able to pass and review segments of your life, you're able to evaluate. And we did that. We remembered the Bible classes we attended. We remembered how seriously and how simply we, we took the scriptures and believed them. Uh, how, how devotedly we loved the Savior. But how many, how many years had passed and the blessing of four children and, and uh, six grandchildren and uh, actually 10 grandchildren. I left four out. 10 grandchildren. And, <laughs> and then, I mean, we're a fertile bunch. They keep coming, you know. And, 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 then, and then we got six great-grandchildren, and, uh, and, and, and you realize uh, through it all, our, our God has been the same. Our God has been the same. Now, to switch gears and to get into the Scriptures, had you and I been living in the first century, anywhere near the city of Ephesus, we would have joined that church. Strong church. Solid, discerning. Founded by those whom the Apostle Paul had nurtured and mentored and, and deep roots and solid theology and, and oh, what a, what, a, what a grand place. And, and then later after having done that, he, he wrote them a letter I don't know if you remember at the very end of the letter to the Ephesians, he says, Grace me with, with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with a love incorruptible. Keep that love strong. Keep it warm. Keep your heart right because times will change. And Things will happen, and before you know it, you'll begin to drift. And that is exactly what happened at Ephesus. Fast forward 30 years, and you get to the book of Revelation. John writes Revelation around 91 or 2. Ephesians is written by Paul around 61, 62. 30 years' time and if you want to read about the church at Ephesus, you will find in Revelation 2, 1 through 7, that they were still busy, still active, still strong, still discerning, but they had left their first love. They didn't love the Lord 30 years later like they did 30 years before. John R. W. Stott writes, they'd fallen from the early heights of devotion to Christ, which they had climbed. They had, dis they had descended to the plains of mediocrity. In a word, they were backsliders. The hearts of the Ephesian Christians had chilled. I feel that up my back when I read that word. Their hearts had chilled. And a little later, he writes, their first flush of ecstasy had passed. Their early devotion to Christ had cooled. They had been in love with him, but now they had fallen out of love with him. You're sitting in this conference, you're walking these hallways, you're, you're meeting friends, you're, you're cultivating new friends. All of that is as it should be. But this is a linger conference. And the whole goal of this is to take time to look at your life like we looked at ours on that visit 
And remember the way you were when it all got started. Remember that, that, that gush of ecstasy, the fun it was when you came to Christ, and the excitement that was a part of your early uh, weeks and months of faith. And over the passing of time, the first flush of ecstasy may have begun to pass already. Only you know. We're all such great cover-up artists. We can fake it. We, we can talk it, but what the Lord really wants from us is that it be real. And as we looked at each other sitting in our car from one place after another we visited, we kept talking about then and now. From the mid-1950s when we married to, to the mid-1990s, how many things had changed? Was our devotion deepening or, or had we begun to cool in our walk with the Savior? What I am talking about, men and women, is the importance of intimacy with God. where you, you have such a relationship with him that it is almost beyond your ability to put it into words. Intimacy. One man defines it, belonging to or characterizing one's deepest nature marked by very close association, contact, or familiarity, a warm friendship developing through long association, suggesting informal warmth and privacy. We read that uh, Adam and Eve, when they were brought together, were brought together in such an intimacy that they were naked and there was no shame. Not just physically naked with one another, but they were emotionally naked with one another. There were no secrets. There, there was nothing held back from each other. There was an openness. There was a, there was a freedom to be. It must have been magnificent in that scene of of innocence in the garden. And then, of course, you know the story. When sin came, the very first thing they did was cover up. The very first thing they did was to run away from the one they had run toward. All that time. And their love had already cooled. There was a breakdown in that familiarity, that intimacy that they would never recover. Sin had begun to take its toll. Now the downside of all of that is that we, we suffer the fallout of that fall. The bruising of that fall is still with us. And everything within us is drawn toward moving away from rather than toward the living God. Hence the need for a conference like this. Where we deliberately think about the one who is worthy. And it isn't us. It is him. It is the living God. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the one who is our Savior. 
Worthy is the one who took our place. And we get that straight in a conference like this and we begin to move in the right direction and we get that straightened out and, and hopefully you begin to develop habits that will go with you and won't cool as the time passes. You see, uh, God will not speed up to catch up with us so that we can walk together. We must slow down that our walk will be in harmony and lockstep with each other. God will not scream and shout to get our attention. So we must make room for him in quietness to hear his voice. God will not work within the framework of our pace and adjust his lifestyle to ours. It works the other way around. And a conference such as this helps us get those priorities straightened out. Because our goal is godliness, remember? Godliness. And it is never automatic and it is never easy. Intimacy is the result of the disciplines that lead us to it. I'll say more about that in a moment, but there is no way we can escape the disciplines of the Christian life if we hope to live godly Christian lives. Let me show you. 1 Timothy chapter 4, please turn. At the end of verse 7 in 1 Timothy 4, we read in the uh, New American Standard Version, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Again, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Discipline yourself. A number of years ago, I read a fine uh, book by Kent Hughes titled Disciplines of a Godly Man. Allow me a few excerpts from that excellent book. It ties in perfectly with what I just read. The statement from Paul to Timothy regarding spiritual discipline, 1 Timothy 4, 7, train yourself to be godly, takes on not only transcending importance, but personal urgency. The word train comes from the Greek word gumnos, G-U-M-N-O-S, gumnos, which means naked. And is the word from which we derive our English gymnasium. In traditional Greek athletic contests, the participants competed without clothing so as not to be encumbered. By New Testament times, it referred to exercise and training in general. And, then, and even then, it was and is a word with the smell of the gym in it, the sweat of a good workout. Exercise yourself, work out, train yourself for the purpose of godliness conveys the feeling of what Paul is writing. Earlier, Kent Hughes provides several examples of discipline from the secular world. We're accustomed to thinking of Ernest Hemingway as a boozy, 
undisciplined genius who got through a quart of whiskey a day for the last 20 years of his life. He was indeed an alcoholic driven by complex passions. But when it came to writing, he was the quintessence of discipline. His early writing was characterized by obsessive literary perfectionism as he spent hours polishing one sentence or searching for just the right word. In Cuba, he daily stood before an improvised desk in oversized loafers on yellow tiles from 6.30 a.m. until noon, every day, every week, carefully marking his production for the day on a chart. His average was only two pages, 500 words. It is a well-known fact that he rewrote the conclusion to his novel, A Farewell to Arms, 17 times in an effort to get it right. Discipline. Michelangelo and Da Vinci's multitudes of sketches, the quantitative discipline of their work prepared their way, the way for the cosmic quality of their work. We wonder at the anatomical perfection of a Da Vinci painting, but we forget that Leonardo Da Vinci on one occasion, drew a thousand hands. Discipline. Thomas Edison came up with the incandescent light after a thousand failures. Joshua Heifetz, considered by many the greatest violinist of the past century, began playing the violin at age three and early began to practice four hours a day until at his death, at age 75, when he had long been the greatest in the world, still practicing some 102,000 hours of practice in his life. Discipline. Those who have watched Mike Singletary, perennial All-Pro, two-time NFL Defensive Player of the Year, and member of the Super Bowl 25 Dream Team play the game and have observed his wide-eyed intensity and his churning, crunching samurai hits are usually surprised when they meet Singletary. He's not an imposing hulk. He's barely six feet tall and weighs maybe 220. His greatness comes from his discipline, Mike Singletary was as disciplined a student of the game as any who ever played it. In his biography, Calling the Shots, he says that in watching game films, he would often run a single play 50, 60 times, and that it takes him three hours to watch a half, a football game on film, which is only 20 to 30 plays because he watches every player, because he mentally knows the opposition's tendency given the down, distance, hash mark, and time remaining, because he reads the opposition's mind through their stances. He is often moving toward the ball's pre-planned destination before the play even develops. Discipline. When he played the game, no one ever doubted that he was the model of a remarkably disciplined life. I take your time for that so that you will understand you will not suddenly, after a conference like this, wake up tomorrow or the next or next week in the morning a, a, a godly man or woman. It doesn't work like that. It requires the spiritual disciplines set forth in the scriptures and never doubt that. Show me a godly life and I will show you a disciplined life behind the scenes. 
such as Paul, who urges his younger friend Timothy to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness. What about Paul himself? I was pleased to read when I came across Philippians 3.10. Please turn. Philippians 3.10 to read the goal of the apostle's life. If you've never read it before, you are able to read it now. What was it that drove the man to become the man he was? It wasn't his training under Gamaliel, though that had a place in it. It wasn't his birth parents, though they played a part in it. It wasn't the structure of his Pharisaical past, though that again played a part. What it was when he got rid of all of the stuff that had left him so proud and arrogant, he wound up with one great goal in life. He states it in Philippians 3, verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If you ever have a chance to own an amplified Bible, buy it, read it. In the amplified Bible, that verse reads as follows. Listen to each word. For my determined purpose is that I may know him that is Christ, that I may know him, that I may progressively become more deeply and intimately acquainted with him, perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly. And that I may in the same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. And that I may so share his sufferings as to be continually transformed into his likeness even to his death. That is a statement of discipline. So when he writes Timothy to become a man trained in godliness, Paul already had many years on him. That had been his purpose. And if you read the context, you will see all the things that he counted as rubbish that were once points of pride where Paul was far too important to Paul. Having laid all of that aside that he may be found in him, verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own, but that which is through faith in Christ. What are the disciplines? What are those disciplines that play such a vital role? By the way, I'm suggesting these various books, and another one I would wish you would own is Dallas Willard's excellent book, The Spirit of the Disciplines. In it, the late Dallas Willard takes you through a journey with the disciplines that will result in you're being a kind of person who no longer drifts here and there, whose love cools, but will stand the test of time. I suggest at least four, there may be many more, but I've found in my life and the lives of those I admire at least four 
major disciplines that are worth our time and our attention through the power of the Holy Spirit. The first is the discipline of simplicity. Simplicity. It will require the decision to reorder our private world. How easy to begin to live cluttered lives, to pick up the agenda of those around us and the world system, which is so appealing to the flesh. But the discipline of simplicity will keep you on mark, on target. You will not be swayed in your purpose as you reorder your private world. The discipline of simplicity. Here's the second. The discipline of silence. Remember the words in Psalm 46? Be still and know that I am God. Verse 10, Psalm 46. The Hebrew says simply the verb stop. It's been rendered be still. Slow down. Back off. But the word literally means stop. When you stop to think about it, as you look back over your years, how much time or how little time has been spent in absolute silence? I was getting off a plane some time ago, and as soon as the engines roar, was winding down, along came the elevator music. So I, I just said, tried to do it very nicely, is there any reason, uh, I said to the airline uh, lady, uh, is there any reason that the, the, the music kicks in just as soon as we have landed and hardly have a chance to get off? She said, oh, sir, uh, people can't stand silence. Really. In our worship service, we occasionally will pause for simply a time of silence. It's sometimes the most meaningful part of our worship. We're not a, here to participate in a performance. Uh, we're, we're not involved in putting on a show. We're, we're, we're here to lead people in a connection with the living God. And since he dwells in absolute silence, we might as well link up. And something beautiful happens. You can almost hear the one next to you breathing. The discipline of silence being still. Simplicity, silence. And this one I will camp on a little bit longer. It's solitude. I'm, I'm all for being with others. I, I, I think it's wonderful that we are here in these numbers. I think it's great that you have your lunches with each other. I think it's terrific that you have come with the one you love. Uh, I see a lot of hand holding. It's beautiful to see a lot of arms around one another, a lot of hugs, uh, and and uh, it, it it's great. Uh, in in life, make sure that you know what it is like to cultivate being all alone, all alone. Dallas Willard The solitude we purposefully abstain from in solitude 
we purposefully abstain from interaction with other human beings, denying ourselves companionship and all that comes from our conscious interaction with others. We close ourselves away. We go to the ocean or to the desert or to the wilderness to be completely alone away from the crowd. This is not just rest or refreshment from nature, though that can contribute to our spiritual well-being. Solitude is choosing to be alone and to dwell on our experience of isolation from other human beings. Solitude frees us, actually. This, above all, explains its primacy and priority among the disciplines. The normal course of day-to-day -day human interactions locks us into patterns of feeling, thought, and action that are geared to a world set against God. Nothing but solitude can allow the development of a freedom from the ingrained behavior that hinder behaviors that hinder our integration into God's order. I challenge you to find time for simplicity, silence, solitude, and fourth, surrender. Surrender is the discipline of trusting the Lord completely. Removing worry from our lifestyle and no longer laughing it off. Laying aside the things that are draining us and our rest in Christ so that we lean hard on the only one who can supply our every need. Please understand who is speaking right now. A man involved in three, four ministries with four adult children, all of them very active, with a number, 10 grandchildren busily engaged here and elsewhere, the emails involved, the phone calls involved, the interaction. Yes, still I say there is value in the simplicity and silence and solitude and a life of surrender. Otherwise, my tank is empty on Sunday. My soul is barren. I love the words of A.W. Tozer. May not the inadequacy of much of our spiritual experience be traced back to our habit of skipping through the corridors of the kingdom like children in the marketplace, always chattering about everything, but pausing to learn the true value of nothing. always chattering about everything. Always having a comment. Always giving an opinion. Always quick with an answer. I've learned in my years in ministry the importance of just acknowledging more than I ever have before in my life, I don't know. Those are great words. Say them with me. I don't know. One more time. I don't know. Now, I challenge you, when you're in a setting and some situation comes up and you really don't know the whole story, you haven't heard the other side. You don't know all the facts. You haven't been privy to the details. 
to use those unusual words. I've had heads turn and look in my direction like, the Bible answer man doesn't know the answer to that. Whoever said I was a Bible answer man? I'm a struggling husband with four kids, two of whom like us and a couple of them don't right now. And <laughs> tomorrow, three of them may and, and, and one won't. And then several days later, three of them won't and one will. It's okay. And I don't always know why. <laughs> I don't know why. So many a night, my last words to Cynthia, as my head sinks on a pillow by her sweet head that sinks on her pillow, I don't know. <laughs> and I hear the wonderful words, I don't either. And you know what? God does. God does. He knows. He knows. He knows why an adult kid will wander. He knows how long you'll be gone. He knows why it happened. All I know is that I feel completely at fault, and I'm not completely at fault. But through simplicity and silence and solitude and surrender, I, I, I don't have to know. I can rely on him. And so there we were in Houston so many years after we had been there before. giving God thanks for his faithfulness over our almost 62 years of marriage that, you know, she gets the applause. Yeah, not, not me. There once, little, there, there once lived a, a, a lovely little fair lady named Amy, little Irish lass, whose life was not all that impressive, sickly. In fact, spent her last years on, the, on, on earth uh, bedridden. Uh, Never one that you would have chosen to be a great, major, massive leader of some movement. But through a series of events, Amy and her Lord developed an intimacy with one another, and she was willing to trust God and to surrender to him whatever his plan was for her didn't marry, uh, was comfortable in her own skin, wound up going of all places to India where she would live her life and pour herself into young girls who were victims of human trafficking living broken lives in a culture that didn't value girls. But she did. And the result was a number of books that Amy Carmichael wrote. And if you've not read them, much of your education is missing. What depth. 
my favorite. From prayer that asks that I may be sheltered from winds that beat on thee, from fearing when I should aspire, from faltering when I should climb higher, from silken self, oh, captain, free thy soldier who would follow thee, from the subtle love of softening things, easy choices, weakenings, not thus are spirits fortified, not this way went to crucified, from all that dims thy Calvary, Lamb of God, deliver me. Give me the love that leads the way, the faith that nothing can dismay, the hope no disappointments tire, the passion that will burn like fire. Let me not sink to be a clod. I love that line. Let me not sink to be a clod. Make me thy fuel, flame of God. Don't be a clod. Don't seek to be a clod. This world and all of its needs longs for the real, genuine item called the Christian, the Christian believer who is not afraid to discipline himself or herself for a life to be well lived wherever he may call us to live it. Here or 10,000 miles from here. Let me not sink to be a claw. Your Father, today, tonight, we thank you for how you speak to us in such a way that it is as if you had sat down beside us and put your huge arm around us and pulled us up close to yourself. Break through the tough membrane of habits. Our strong tendency to lie to ourselves. Our great ability to fake it. And as we bleed through, and as truth begins to be lived out, find a place for us, Lord, where we might serve you, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Help us not sink to be a clod. Make us your fuel. Flame of God. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, I pray. Everyone said, Amen. Oh God, you're oh my God, I seek you. Oh my soul, it longs for 